Uh, okay, so last week we um, only looked at a couple verses, and unfortunately we're going to have to do the exact same thing tonight. Uh, the reason being uh, because, I'm sorry, it wasn't last week, it was two weeks ago. Uh, the reason being is because next week we're going to have that question night, and I didn't want to start into the next section and immediately have to stop. So the next section is going to be pretty much most of chapter 12, and there's going to be um, a lot going on there as far as the disciplining of the sun bit. And so once we get into that, I really want to be able to give that the time that it deserves. And um, so uh, just by way of, way of recap, uh, we started at the end of chapter 11 going into this new theme of, hey, this is what faith is. And then at the very end, it went into the idea of this is mo- we're moving forward in the faith. And he's going to continue that same idea through verses 2 before he gets onto the topic of the discipline. So uh, we're going to be looking at Hebrews 12, uh, 1 through 2. And uh, Chris, would you mind reading these? Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <laughs> so, okay, um, well, let's go back and read verse 1. And there's a lot of stuff going on here in these two verses. You, you, you wouldn't think so because, of, you know, typically we go through a much larger uh, group of, of, of verses. But here there's, you know, a lot to go on. So first off, he starts off this section with a metaphor. And he's going to switch it up in the next verses, and then he's going to give as an example later on. But uh, for right now, it's just the metaphor of, of the running a race, okay? So it says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses. And so this really ties it into the end of chapter 11. It ties it in as the same thought. He's just kind of building on it. So he gives all these different, you know, the hall of faith, all these different people who who did these things in faith. And so he's saying, okay, so therefore, since we also have such a large, since we um, have this this, this cloud of witnesses. Um, And that takes us to an an idea that I I think most of us have had, um, especially when we were younger. For those of you who grew up in the church, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, it, we get this imagery in our head where um, they are watching us, right? The, the, these, people, the, these people from the faith that are mentioned in chapter 11, they're watching us, right? They are, it's like in a theater. So be careful what you do lest they see you. They're watching you do it, right? And we get this idea of them like sitting in, in, a, in an amphitheater, uh, like for the gladiator games or something, and they're all watching us to see what we're doing. But the, the actual idea here is, is not we have such a cloud of witnesses, so let's be in terror of them watching us. The idea here is we have, this, we have these examples of encouragement for us. Since we have these, these examples, we can look to them for encouragement. So since we have such great examples, let us, uh, let us um, lay aside every hindrance. So totally different idea. I, I know me for myself. I, I kind of um, I remember <laughs> I remember doing some things as a kid. I was like, I was thinking, gee, I hope Abraham wasn't watching me do that. <laughs> you know. Anyways, uh, just I think it's it's backwards. It's not so much uh, them watching us as us watching them. So put that in your pipe, Abraham. So okay, not from fear from what they will see not from fear of what they see, from encouragement that we can go and do likewise. Okay, all right. And so the idea here is that, you know, we are going to go and um, we can do in the faith because they did in the faith. They are our examples. And so we can say, okay, look, I don't feel like a, like a faith warrior. I don't feel like I've got this, this all together. But then you look at these, these people that he mentioned. These are people that messed up regularly, and the things that they did didn't even seem like faith. But the fact that we can look back at them and God counted it as faith that encourages us because, well, for twofold. First off, that tells us what can be done. There are, uh, we, we can do this. Others have done it. We can do. And then the second thing that, that tells us is that our efforts will be rewarded, not despised. Sometimes we think that maybe our faith isn't good enough or, or what we do isn't good enough. Our prayers aren't strong enough or, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really doing the ministry that, that, that Jesus would have done. I just don't measure up, right? But when we look at these people of the faith, these are people who were just like us, and yet God took their feeble efforts, and he didn't despise them. He rewarded them for it. 
So th these are very important things. And if we move on in the verse, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance. Now, it's going to go on talking about sins in just a minute, but hindrance is actually mentioned separate from sin, and I don't think that that's uh, uh, an accident. Like, sometimes in a list, the things will be synonyms, right? They'll just kind of all be listing similar items. Uh, that's not, apparently not what was happening here. A hindrance isn't necessarily a sin. So he's still on the imagery of, of running. He's, he hasn't less, left this metaphor. And a hindrance is anything that is slowing you down. Now, uh, if for those of you who have done hindrance, I'm sorry, endurance uh, uh, sports, you, you know that every pound counts. So you want, you know, the lightest gear. Like if you're, if you're biking, right, you, want some, you don't want a, a bike that weighs 50 pounds. You want maybe a bike that weighs maybe 15 pounds or 20 pounds, somewhere around there. That sounds a lot better. Uh, you know, you don't want these big, heavy tires with knobs on them. You want the, the, thin, the thin ones that have just a real smooth surface. They're, they're not real heavy. You don't want an inner tube. You get rid of that, and you have a, a, a tubeless tire. You know, you do all these little things to just drop a little bit of weight here and there. And you do that because in endurance sports, it's not about being done in five seconds. It's about going the distance. You, you want to drop every pound. And so with the idea with the hindrance, it's more talking about if we're sticking with the metaphor of, of, of running a race, it's more talking about losing the extra weight and, and maybe dropping some fat. You know what I mean? Like when you're preparing for endurance, you may want to, want to drop a couple pounds. And even in biking, um, when you descend on, down from like a mountain, a couple pounds really does make a lot of difference about what your top speed is. Um, so we're not just talking about uh, weight as far as maybe changing out your gear, but we're also talking about maybe trimming down a little bit. Um, because every pound does count. And that seems to be what he's talking about here. Not so much things that are sinful, but what are we hanging on to? What do we need to let go that's holding us back? Not Once again, because there's a lot of times that we do this. Well, it's not a sin. That's not really the issue. We're not talking about sins here. We're talking about a hindrance. Is it something that's getting in the way of your progress forward? There's some people who need to let things go that other people don't need to let go. You know what I mean? Um, for instance, if I was addicted to video games and I couldn't operate my life, right? I'm just sitting around all day playing video games, it's, it's taken over my life. I've become very irresponsible. I should probably just give it up. Are video games bad? No, lots of people can be, play video games. If I'm able to just like play video games and then live my life and still work and do the things that God, that's fine. It's just like having a board game or a puzzle. Like, it's fine. But if it's all-consuming, then it's become hindrance to me. And that's a, that's a problem with hindrances is we want a golden standard of this is wrong for everybody, right? Like, so looking at explicit content online, that's easier. Don't do that. We all know, don't do that. But when it gets to the gray areas of hindrances, it gets a lot harder because we actually have to examine ourselves and let the Holy Spirit speak to us and then actually let it go. And this is the problem is because the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart, so you don't know what he's speaking to me. But get this, if I refuse the Holy Spirit in my heart, you're going to suddenly know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart because my attitude is going to change. And you're going to think, this guy's got something up. So hindrances aren't necessarily bad. They're just unnecessary things. They are unnecessary things. You're running a race, and you're taking a bunch of unnecessary things. So in your Christian life, how, how does this apply? Drag it over. What are you taking with you that's slowing you down? And then it says, oops, slid down quite a ways. There we go. And then it says in, um, well, let, let me come back to that. Okay, and then it says, so in the next verse, let us lay aside every hindrance, or next part of the verse, and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Now we're talking about sin, things that actually are wrong. So as well as there are things that we hang on to, things that we're not letting go of, hindrances, okay, this is a perfect way to say this. A hindrance is something that you're hanging on to and you won't let go. A sin is something that ensnares you when you put your guard down. Something that it's holding on to you. <laughs> and maybe that's too simple and simplistic, but I think it, it kind of gets the point across. Uh, sin latches on to it, it, it. It's a fight to let go. A hindrance is something that I just really like doing, and I don't want to give it up. Which I guess sin can sometimes fall into that category too. But uh, sins really have this way of like waiting in the corner to pounce on us. So it says, uh, the sin is so easy and sinners, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Not just running, but running with endurance. And so this is, this is the difference here. And you see people do this with the work of the Holy Spirit too. 
They want an instant flash in the pan, good feeling, and then they want to go on with their life. Um, a lot of times you, you deal with people who are going w- through panic attacks and depression and different stuff, and they say, okay, I don't want to have this uncomfortable feeling. And you say, okay, well, what's causing this uncomfortable feeling? What do we need to start working through? And they don't want to change what they're doing that's causing the panic or the depression. They just want the symptom to go away. Right? I mean, like, how many of you guys, the doctor says, well, you need to stop eating this kind of food. And you're like, well, yeah, that, that's interesting, but I'm going to go ahead and keep doing it anyways. And then you start having these negative symptoms, and the doctor's like, well, this is why I said you need to change your diet. It's kind of like that. Well, I want to keep eating what I want to eat. I just don't want the symptoms of eating these bad things. And obviously, that's not bacon. Bacon's not the problem. Bacon's never the problem. It's probably the kale. It's probably the kale. Uh, that stuff can kill you. You know, it's proven fact, okay? 100% of people who have eaten kale have, have died, or they will die one day, okay? Therefore, kale must be the cause of death, okay? So let us run with endurance. The, the, this is not, not running with a spurt or getting fired up for a day. This is a marathon, right? It's a marathon, not a, um, not a sprint. That's how you'd say that. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Because you have to pace yourself. When, when you're, who here has ever done a, done, a, done a race? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about, Danny. Anybody else? You did, you get, okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. In a race, when you start, they, they do the fire pistol or whatever, however they start that race, um, everybody takes off real fast, as fast as they can go, right? And they wear themselves out real fast, <laughs> real fast. And you, you have to consciously not follow the flow you have to consciously set your own pace. That doesn't mean that you're just like walking, but you're holding back some of your energy. Why? Because you're in it for a long haul. You're in it for an endurance. You're not in it for it to be done in a second, right? It, it's, it's a total different feel. And you're not, you're not trying to get, get fired up for a second. You're trying to go the distance. And in order for you to go the distance, you have to pace yourself, bring yourself back in. And that's the idea here. Um, when I was when I was doing my, uh, they call it a century. So the idea is you ride a hundred miles on your bike in a day. Like you can you can take a break. That's fine. But it's one day, hundred miles. When I did that, um, I first started. I, I did it almost like I was going for a leisure stroll. You know, I'm like, okay, let's go. Got a hundred miles to go. You don't want to you don't want to wear yourself out in the first twenty miles. That's not good. So I, I, I'm pacing myself, getting, make sure I'm getting plenty of food at the right times, you know, making sure that everything's going right. And I was able to finish it because it was that endurance thing. Um, and endurance was really about being steady. E- endurance, it's not just about sticking with it. It's about you keep going regardless. See, that there's times in any competition where you don't feel like it anymore. You're done. Maybe you just kind of lose that spark whatever. You're just like doing it, and you're like, oh, I decided I don't even like this sport. I don't know why I'm out here. I, I, I just want to go home and go back inside. And if you've done any of these kinds of sports, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There, there's a time when you're just like, I'm done. I'm done. And uh, w- with endurance, it's not just about s- using up all your energy at one time. It's also about not giving up in during those low times. Because there's going to be a lot of times in the Christian faith when you're just not not there. You don't have your act together. And endurance is where you just keep on going. And you can get into heaven stumbling and tired. You you can get there broken and, and, and disease-ridden and, and a mess. You can get there that way. That That's absolutely fine. But if you burn yourself out trying to impress God and trying to earn your salvation, you'll never make it to heaven. I got to get there perfect. I've got to always have things. That's not endurance. Endurance is sticking with it over the long haul, not a flash in the pan. Well, today I did this, and I did this. You know, and, and, and let me give you a little practical, practical application here. New Year's hits. What do you do? I'm going to read the whole Bible this year. Uh, I'm going to n- not miss a single ser- church service. I'm going to worship God for two hours every day. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, I, I've got this, I got this prayer board that I put up in my closet, and i got all this stuff, and I'm going to stick with it. Right? I've never done this before in my life, but all of a sudden, because it's a new year, I'm going to stick with it every single day and never mess up, not see one single time. That doesn't win the race. That's a spurt and a day. Today I did great. I went to church. I read my Bible. I did all this stuff, right? And then the next day hits, and you're like, well, I mean, I read my Bible yesterday, so it probably counts right, for the next day, too. You know? And it, it, it's not about getting yourself worked up. 
Um, and this is this is the big problem that can happen with things like conferences. This is this is why this is why when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, I brought up conferences a number of times because we go to conferences, we get excited, we get worked up, and then we come home and we just let it die. I mean, remember when we were kids and we went to youth camp or kids camp, either one. You go and the Holy Spirit's there and you're all excited. I'm going to make new friends. I'm going to change my whole life. And you get home and the next week you haven't stuck with any of the things that made camp so special. You don't have your daily devotional time. You don't have your worship time. You don't have people in your corner who love God and are there with you cheering you on. You are back with your old friends and your old school doing your old thing. You didn't stick with it. Flashes in the pan don't work. And endurance is about sticking with it. And uh, But another thing that, that people, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about the whole marathon thing, but um, people, w- when you say it's not, a sprint, it's a marathon. In people's heads, sometimes they get this idea that that means you can just kind of stroll along, right? But it's not like that because every s- wasted, s- excuse me, uh, sorry, every wasted second adds up. You know what I mean? If you decide, well, I'm not really going to pay attention to where I'm going in this race, and you start losing seconds, the other people start catching up, you start losing your place. Every second does add up. Just because you're pacing yourself for the marathon doesn't mean that you're taking a vacation. You're still pursuing the goal. You're just hitting it even, hitting it even. It's more important that you stick with an even routine than that you get all fired up and do everything all at once. And a lot of times, especially especially in the church, we we make people feel bad if they don't get real gung-ho and sign up for everything all at once. So... We get to the end of verse 1, and it says this, Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Now, I do want to emphasize, he says, the race that lies before us. Okay, so let me kind of explain what I mean here. Not all of us are running the same race. Not all of us are running the same race. There's going to be some of us that have to deal with... There's basically two kinds of people in the world that God uh, works through, if you want to say it like that. There's going to be group one. These people are the people who go through extreme difficulty. Think of people like Corey Ten Boom. Okay. These people just seems like nothing ever goes right. There's problem after problem that comes by. And then there's a second group. These people, it's not that nothing bad ever happens to them. It's that it's almost like they're cursed to watch the people who bad things always happen to. And why I think God does this is because so that we can lift each other up at different times and different seasons. You know what I mean? Not all of us are going to have it as bad as Corey Ten Boom. There's going to be some people who just really have it a bad way. Um, I've seen some kids, uh, you know, they're five or six, and they get, you know, diagnosed with this just life-controlling disease that alters their life, and they have a very short life, and then they die. Sometimes don't even make it into their 20s, and, and, and they die. Well, I didn't, I haven't had that struggle. As some of us sit back and we say, you know, I've had a pretty good life. You know, my, my, my parents lived for a while. I had some difficulties, but I'm in pretty good health, and I have married, and I have a house, like, Nothing really to complain about. And that's what I'm talking about. There's going to be those two different types of people. And it's okay that you don't know everything that other person's going through. What's not okay is if you're group one that you don't say, woe is me, everything's terrible. And if you're group two that you don't say, hey, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, it's not all that bad. You know what I mean? Everybody is in their own station running it their own race. Pay attention to the race that you're running and, and run it well. Don't run somebody else's race well. Run your race well. Everybody has their race. Your struggles are yours. And this speaks, obviously, of looking ahead. If you're a runner, obviously, you you would just look in front of your feet. So that takes us to verse 2, and it says, Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So let's just look at that, keeping our eyes on Jesus. But how do we not give up? How do we keep going? By fixing our eyes on Christ. There's something different that happens when you fix your eyes on the problem or on yourself, on self-empowerment or whatever, or when you fix your eyes on Christ. It's like that song says, you know, uh, turn your eyes on Jesus and the things of the earth, just get, they just get dimmer. They're not so in your face. But if you're sitting there just constantly talking about your bad problems, and here's the problem, there's a little bit of a conundrum. Pro- when problems come, you kind of have to process them, huh? You lose your spouse, right? You're not just, oh, I'm okay now, because I'm thinking about Jesus, so I'm fine. No, no, there is still a grieving process, you go through that darkness, and sometimes it lasts years. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. And so then after that, you're, you kind of keep on going, but there's that time when you're in the valley. 
And so I'm not saying that that's not keeping your eyes focused on Christ, but there is a difference between focusing your eyes on Christ and abandoning yourself in the grief. There's a huge difference between those two things. So what, what about the witnesses? Why do we need Jesus to be the witness since we already have all those witnesses from chapter 11? See, it says, keeping our eyes on Jesus. I thought you just said we're, we're encouraged by all these witnesses from chapter 11. So we're keeping our eyes in both places. Um, and and uh, maybe uh, it would be easier to just say it like this. The witnesses, they stand behind us to encourage us. Hey, keep going. You can do this. But Christ stands before us as the perfecter. Okay, so if it was just Christ as the only example, some people might be tempted to say something like this. Well, Jesus is just too good. I'll never attain his standard, so why even try to keep pressing on in, in faith? And um, for that, we have the examples of real-life people. It wasn't just Jesus because he's obviously perfect, and so he's going to do everything right. There's also people who have still traveled the, the, the journey of faith. So how is Jesus different than um, all the other examples from chapter 11? Well, because of two things it says here in, chapter, in verse 2. And this is aside from him being God and them not being God. The, he is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. So different translations are going to say this a little bit differently. Um, some are going to say more in terms of being a forerunner, right? Some are going to be more in terms of maybe champion. Um, or there, there might be some that say more of the source of our faith. Typically, I don't like the New, New Living Translation as a quotable version because it's, it, it's more of um, not so as precise with its translation. It's more of just kind of paraphrased. Uh, but I think that it really has it in, in, in an order when it says, uh, when it translates it as the initiator of our faith. I think that's really spot on. So he not only is the, uh, he's not only the, the, the initiator, the pioneer, the forerunner, champion, source, whatever you want to say there, but he's also the perfecter of it. So another way of saying that is that he accomplished fully what it would take for the New Testament faith to be a reality. Whatever is necessary for that to happen, he did that. And this is different uh, from the examples in chapter 11, obviously. Uh, Guthrie, to, I'm loosely paraphrasing here, but Guthrie says um, in his commentary, he says this, uh, he cleared the path so we can run it. The way is open, but troubles persist. And I think that's a pretty good way of summarizing that. So he goes on to say, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. For the joy. Hold on just a minute. Okay, so not only did he, uh, not only did he perfect the faith, also he became our example by enduring. It says, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. So Jesus, when he was here, when he was going through these struggles, he kept his eyes on the outcome, right? Um, obviously, he couldn't have kept his eyes on Christ because he is Christ. So uh, it's a little bit different for him, uh, but it's, it, 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 it still leaves us a good example. Um, what, was the, what was the thing that he was focusing on? Well, it says here, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we see the first thing uh, that would have been what he, was, um, what he kept his eyes on, the outcome-wise, would have been sitting at the right hand of God. Now, it's a little bit of a, and we've talked about it a lot, so I don't really want to waste too much time here, but the way that he had that before he came to earth, and so he just re-inherited it, but he kept it, his eyes on that, and another thing that we see here is that um, the outcome is that he brought glory to the Father through the redemption of sons and daughters, us. So I think that if we look at this and we say, okay, so what is the joy for the joy that lay before him? What is the joy specifically? And typically in commentaries, you're going to see people go in one or two directions. Either he, his joy is that he saved us or his joy is that uh, he uh, brought glory to God and, and, and had the whole right hand of the Father thing. So... I don't think it's either or. I think that a lot of times commentaries and scholars make it either or, and I don't think it's either or. I would say that joy is not one thing. The joy set before him is not one thing. It's kind of a package deal. The joy set before him was, yes, the right hand of the Father, glory, bring glory to God, uh, bringing us redemption. It was a lot of different things. But either way, Jesus gave us the way of faith, the defini- not, not, not the definition, but the... Um, how faith is accomplished, and that's this. 
He endured difficulty because of the outcome, showing us what, 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 how you do faith. And so you could say, let me just re-say that in a way that's not so confusing. I'll just stick with the PowerPoint. How about that? The way of faith is enduring difficulty because of the outcome. When you're faced with the, faced with the problems that you're going through and you're faced with different things, it's enduring through them uh, because of the outcome through it. We're not just holding on to some dead faith or some doing it just to do it. No, there, there's a reason for our faith, right? We're holding on because of the weight of glory that's coming. We're, we're holding on because of, you know, um, the, the, the new life and the new heavens and the new earth. All these different things that, that, that we're going to be partakers of, we're, we're holding on because of the outcome. So it says in, in, in verse 2, it says, For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. And when we read that, sometimes we think, the night of his death, right? I mean, you guys see what I'm saying, right? Well, we read that and we say, okay, he endured the cross that one single night. But no, 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 no. When, when it's saying he endured the cross, he's talking about the whole package deal. So basically, his entire coming to earth and that whole experience culminating with his death. Um, and a way of saying that is that Jesus lived under the shadow of the cross his whole life. He knew what he was here for. He knew what was coming, and he had to walk through that. He had to experience, you know, he, 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 he humbled himself to become a man. He went through that whole life being despised by the religious leaders, and then the, the cross and all that. So it's kind of a package deal. And uh, here we have, and I'll get back to this in just a minute. Well, no, I'll go to it right now. Why not? For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And... <laughs> Some verses are almost humorous, and I, I think that that's kind of lost. So I'll, I'll try to break it down why this is humorous. So first off, what, is, what does it mean to despise? Despising something is basically overlooking it. There's a video game called Mass Effect, and one of the guys says on it, I will do, do, do you the greatest harm uh, that, that someone can do to their enemy, that of being ignored. That of being ignored. Um, uh, and it, it's th- th- it's kind of the idea of despising. It's completely overlooking something to treat as though having little value, right? Have you ever had somebody walk past you and it's almost like you don't even exist? Uh, I come from California. I'm very familiar with that. Uh, there was definitely the the rich people, uh, the middle class people, and then the poor people. And it was very evident that I was in the poor people group because it just people treat you differently. And there's uh, well, if you've ever been to El Paso, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so, <clears throat> despising is basically uh, holding as though they have very little, very little uh, value. And that brings us to, this is the, the funny bit here, is there's kind of a, a I don't want to call it a play on words, but it kind of, uh, playing on the idea, I guess, is maybe, maybe better, uh, of shame and being despised. Because, so okay, let, let's, let's tie everything together. Number one, crucifixion was probably the most, if not one of the most shameful ways you could die. It was reserved for, for criminals. It was just something that everybody laughed at you. Oh, this guy, you know, is going down to the record books of a total screw-up, you know. Uh, and that's how Jesus died. He didn't have, like, this honorable death. He had this very, very shameful death. And then the second thing about that is the world shamed Jesus, right? So the, 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 Jews, ca- the Jews, his own people cast him out. The, the Romans were right along with him, and they were really the, the, the forefronts of the Gentiles at the time, so they kind of stood in the place of, of all the others, you know, and so you have the world shaming Jesus when he came. You got God himself coming, and, and there's no, like, welcome mat or anything, so he's shamed by the world. And then you have, earlier in the book, it talked about those people who abandoned Christ, who, 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 who who leave the faith, backsliding, in, in other words, um, that they, are, uh, they can't be forgiven as, as long as they're doing this because they are opening Christ up to shame. They're, 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 they're shaming him. They're, they're holding him up to contempt. And so you have this, you have this, he, he's talking about how Jesus basically shamed shame in light of all these different ideas of how Jesus was shamed. And, and so you could say Jesus' response is that he treated it as completely insignificant. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, treating it as insignificant, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It really, really has a whole uh, changes the whole outlook of of, um, of Jesus. Because remember, <laughs> pretend like you are in Jesus' shoes. Not don't pretend like you're Jesus. Pretend like you're in His shoes, and you have to do this thing. It's not fun. 
everybody's making fun of you. Nobody's on your side. Everybody just abandons you. I mean, I don't handle that kind of stuff well. And we're talking about not stepping on a nail while taking about part pallets. Uh, we're we're talking about we're talking about something much much worse than that. Um, so, anyways, um, so don't be overcome by struggles. And this is this is the difficult thing. So our struggles that we go through right now, there's so much now to us. Sometimes they're all that we can focus on, especially if you're one of the uh, unfortunate people who are in constant pain. Like, for instance, if you have knee problems, you know exactly what I'm talking about. People who have knee problems, they're like in constant pain. If you're one of those unfortunate people who are in constant pain, and it's, con- it's always in your face, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say, hey, don't be overwhelmed. I mean, it, it's hard to hear, don't be overwhelmed by your struggles, because it's like... <laughs> I am overwhelmed by my struggles. This is a constant pain for me. Um, but those struggles that you're going through, they're insignificant in the light of the future. And once again, that's going to rub us the wrong way because it's like my pain means something. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's wrong to be overwhelmed. That's totally fine. But what I'm saying is don't give up. And that's how you, when I say don't be overcome by the struggle, I mean don't give up in the struggle. That's how you don't give up in the struggle. You, you, don't, you don't quit. It's okay if you don't feel yourself. It's okay if your emotions are wild, if you're overwhelmed by this burden. Those things, that's fine. That God's not going to like reject you for that. But in your struggling, don't give up because the weight of glory that's coming is far greater than whatever pain we are now going through. Um, and especially if things go any worse in the U.S. Uh, and persecution becomes a factor here as it is in other parts of the world, um, this is definitely going to be something that we're going to have to remember. So... And then we get to the very last bit of verse 2, and it says, And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And this is my main point while highlighting this, is that Jesus arrived safely at the other side to sit down. The same thing is going to happen to us. Not to sit down at the right hand of the Father, but we are going to arrive at the other side too. The struggles you're going through, they're not going to be forever. They might feel like they're forever. It might be very difficult <laughs> But it, there will eventually come a day when it's no longer going to bother you anymore. And this is good news, not bad news. This, this is great. Um, if everybody has to die anyways, you might as well die uh, knowing that there's hope. I mean, that sounds, sounds worth it to me. So to summarize all these things that we looked at tonight, mm. basically the end of chapter 11, the beginning of chapter 12, it all talks about moving forward in faith. That was the whole idea here. And he's going to start talking about the disciplining of the sons uh, in chapter 12, and we'll look at that more, but for right now, it's kind of a good place to end it so we don't start a whole new topic uh, before uh, we get into the questions next week. So, uh, were there any questions about anything we looked at or talked about tonight?